I'm Sue O'Connell. Tonight on Greater Boston, as Donald Trump awaits arraignment in Manhattan and calls on his supporters to protest, what do these charges mean for the former president, his fellow Republicans, and the country as a whole? Then, the Bruins make history and clinch a spot in the postseason. What can we expect as the big games get closer and closer? That's ahead. For the first time in American history, as you know, a former U.S. president is about to surrender himself to law enforcement and appear in court on criminal charges. Donald Trump flew to New York this afternoon and is expected to appear before a Manhattan judge tomorrow on about 30 counts, including felonies related to business fraud and campaign finance violations stemming from alleged hush money payments that he made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Now, since the news first broke of his coming indictment, the former president has come out in full force against the case, urging his supporters to protest who he's called the, quote, corrupt Manhattan district attorney, the Trump-hating judge, and the charges he's amounting to election interference. And though we won't know what the exact charges of the contents of the indictment are until the official filing is unsealed after Trump appears in court, unless there's a leak, he and his attorneys are already mounting a full-throated defense. We know that this was based on Stormy Daniels. We know that this was dismissed by the FEC and this was dismissed by federal prosecutors seven years ago. We know it's in it. It's a bunch of garbage. Election interference through prosecutors is the new ballot stuffing for the Democrat Party. So far, the American people don't seem to think so. 60% of adults in the U.S. support these charges, according to a new CNN poll, CNN SSRS poll that was out today. Republicans are staunchly against the charges, with nearly 80% disapproving, and more than 54% saying they strongly disapprove. Now, we all remember what happened the last time Trump supporters felt like an election was being stolen from him. So what should we expect this time? I'm joined by former Massachusetts its public safety secretary and Suffolk County Sheriff Andrea Cabral, and Ozzy Palomo, founding partner and managing director of Chartwell Strategy Group. Welcome to both of you. Andrea, I, I want to start with you. Um, it could be both politically motivated and justified that the charges be brought, right? It isn't, I keep hearing people talk about this as a one of, or the other, right? Oh, it's politically motivated, it, it doesn't mean anything, or it's justified, it's got nothing to do with politics. It can be both. Well, it can be. I think in this case, uh, you're talking about someone, and I, you know, I've said this about Trump many, many times, he was never a real president, but he was always a criminal. I mean, Trump's criminality goes way, way, way back um, to his real estate developer days. And this idea, I mean, the allegation that comes from him and his attorneys and his supporters that this is a politically motivated um, prosecution rings hollow when you stop to think that this was the first step he took or one of the first steps he took to rig the election, to change the outcome of the election. Because had people known that he had paid off Stormy Daniels, because that happened before the election, it might have had a negative impact on his ability to be elected. Um, so the election rigging in the form of this payoff and the cover-up that followed is pretty much, uh, you know, sort of a seminal step toward him rigging an election in his favor. And to say that it's politically motivated when you have politicians around the country that have to get, that get elected, have campaign contributions, spend that money in certain ways, and have to be held accountable for how that money is spent and how they note that it has been spent, that's a very, very big deal to say that the president is exempt from all of that. So I think that rings hollow. I think that accusation rings hollow. Ozzy, I was talking to a, uh, a, a law professor uh, who was also a former uh, prosecutor, I think, and I asked the same question about the politics and had this been in the federal court instead of a state court, would there have been fewer claims of, um, of politics because the person isn't elected? And she pointed out that federal court judges are appointed by elected officials from parties. Um, is it muddying the waters of really looking at the issue every time someone 
everyone says this is politically motivated. Yeah, I think you have to look at the fact that you know District Attorney Bragg campaigned on becoming District Attorney and getting elected District Attorney on going after Donald Trump. I think these are charges that were, as referenced before, were dismissed or failed to look upon by the Department of Justice, the FEC failed to look at this. And Alvin Bragg's own predecessor in Cy Vance also took a look at this and decided not to. Uh, I also think that Alvin Bragg was, you know, kind of hesitated to go after President Trump on these charges. And I think there was some political motivation and pressure on him to follow through on this. Uh, but again, he's trying to you know, take something that is largely a federal issue becoming a state issue. He's looking at a misdemeanor and trying to expand and become, you know, have it become a felony. So you really can't deny the political undertones that Alvin Bragg has taken on this. Um, so, you know, it, that goes without saying, and I think it's pretty evident to anyone who sees this. You want to respond I, to that? I disagree with that. I, I really, I mean, I disagree with it on the basis that, first of all, Cy Vance accepted a $25,000 campaign contribution and then sort of made the decision that he wasn't going to go after the Trump children or, or, you know, go after Donald Trump. I do think that Bragg wanted to take a look at this anew. And I think that that certainly makes a difference. If you're the DA and you're going to own a prosecution, you want to dot, you know, every I and cross every T. Um, but every, every single um, allegation against Trump is characterized as politically motivated. And after a while, it's the boy who cried wolf. It, everything can't be politically motivated. Every prosecution, every investigation, every allegation can't be politically motivated. And we have to face the fact that he's done many of these things, if not all of them. I see, is it a, a bit of a manifestation on the Trump and Republicans part? Um, you know, the lock her up, the accusing everybody of being uh, in, in the tank for uh, the, the Democrats, uh, always pushing forward this narrative that you can't trust the government unless, of course, they are the government. Um, you know, ignoring the fact that there are problems with our justice system, deep, deep problems with our justice system when it comes to black and brown people, black and brown men. But, you know, they don't recognize that problem, but they now think that Trump has a problem. It's a lot of spinning plates here to try and keep a narrative straight. It's a lot of spinning plates, but I think you kind of deal with the spinning plate that's before you. And this is one that's obviously, again, to most, they can see the political undertones. You know, I, I won't talk for Cy Vance and, you know, question his political judgment on whether or not he persecuted this based on a campaign payment. Um, but the f fact of the matter is, is this is the issue that Donald Trump is facing. Uh, and Cy, you know, excuse me, Alvin Bragg is giving giving him every political motivation to kind of poke holes at this. Um, he's got, you know, President Trump has bigger problems. There are other cases out there that I would argue are probably much stronger with much severe consequences. But to go after a six, you know, six year claim that this is payment and hush money, you know, doing it now, I think is a lot of the questions that are being asked. We don't have Cy Vance in, pro in person, but we do have a little bit of Cy Vance uh, sound. Cy Vance, of course, the former Manhattan District Attorney. I would be mindful of not committing some other criminal offense like obstruction of governmental administration which is interfering with or uh, you know, by by threat or otherwise right. the operation of government uh, and uh, I think that could take what perhaps we think is not the strongest case when you add a count like that put it in front of a jury it can change the jury's mind about the severity of the case that they're yeah. looking at Andrew let's talk a little bit about um the, the call to action uh, that it, it has been happening, the uh, attacks on the law enforcement, the district attorney, the folks, the judges. Uh, I, I, am, I am both torn between giving it too much attention and then torn that I'm not giving it enough attention. Um, as, as we know, January 6th seemed to happen right under everybody's noses. Uh, and then some people were shocked of the severity of, of the attack. Um, what, what, where are we now? What should we be doing in terms of the call for Trump and others that they're giving for people to protest regarding this indictment? Well, I think it should be taken very, very seriously. We've, we've had numerous examples uh, of what can happen uh, when it goes completely unchecked. I think, but I think everybody is sort of mindful of that. I also think that time has passed. Um, I think there are more people that are aware of the level of sort of grift and our, more people are fed up with the level of corruption. So that I, I'm not at all sure that you're going to get this kind of response that he was able to gin up on January 6th. I think it will be you know, somewhat less than that. And also people are mindful that the DOJ prosecuted all of the, as many people as they can find, they're still seeking people out and prosecuting them for the January 6th insurrection. So there are, it is not a consequence less 
uh, choice that people will make if they decide to protest violently. And they have the right to protest, and certainly under the First, First Amendment. But to protest violently or to create some sort of a riot situation, I think people are mindful that those prosecutions will follow. Ozzy, your take on what people should be saying, lawmakers, Republican lawmakers, to people regarding if they're unhappy that Trump has been indicted? Yeah, look, I think first and foremost, words, you know, have consequences, and we saw that on January 6th, rightfully so. Uh, and I tend to agree. I think most people are cognizant of the fact that I think you are allowed to protest under the First Amendment up to a certain point, making sure that it's, it doesn't cross that line. Now, you've had most Republican leaders... Uh, Say that. Actually, say it publicly. It's saying a protest and, and a, you know is welcomed under the First Amendment, but to do it within checks and make sure that there's no harm done. I think you know President Trump obviously has a way with words, uh, and it'll be interesting to see if he has issued a gag order, you know, leading into this arrangement so that, to prevent something from happening. So. Let's take a listen to New York City Mayor Eric Adams. He has a warning for folks who may be coming to the Big Apple. While there may be some rabble rouses. Thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, a message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. New York City is our home, not a playground for your misplaced anger. Um, Andrea, is that, do you think that's enough? Was that strong enough? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to criticize it because I think that he's trying to sort of balance his tone not be too aggressive, but also not be too recalcitrant in terms of telling people to not come. I think ultimately, if people do come and they act out, I think the city will um, let the actions of those who are supposed to keep order sort of speak for them. So he's made, he's issued the warning. He said, don't do it. Um, and it now remains to be seen whether or not that's heated. But I think he was trying to st strike a tonal balance. Ozzy, let's talk about the politics of this. I mean, I, we keep saying unprecedented. I think it's it's going to be unprecedented the number of times that we have said this, said this and will continue to say this. Beside the fact that Trump is obviously a former president, he is a presidential candidate. He's actually one of the few who's really declared in the Republican side. Um, how, and this isn't the end, right? We, there may be another indictment in Georgia. There may be an indictment regarding the Mar-a-Lago documents. He's got the trial coming up with Jean Carroll, the, uh, the defamation trial regarding uh, the, the rape um, uh, charge that, was, that she's leveled against him. How do Republican candidates run in this chaos and get their message out and get fundraising um, without getting all of this on them? Yeah, I think like with all things with Donald Trump, and if you're running against him, you've got to thread that line. Um, I think we've talked before, there's about a 25 to 30 percent of that electorate that's going to be with him no matter what. Uh, I think there's a lot of folks that look at this and say, you know, I sympathize with the fact that this is politically motivated. You can't deny that. But I'm not with him because it's a distraction. So I think if you're a candidate, you better have an answer and you better be able to thread that line as to kind of go be able to go after the issue, but not jeopardize losing support with that base because you're going to need them at some point in the primaries that are up ahead. Andrew, what should uh, Biden, as the you know, he's not a candidate yet, but we expect he is running. Um, what should candidate for re-election Joe Biden be doing or saying? Do you think in response uh, to the indictments, uh, possible plural indictments? Nothing. Just stick to his knitting. That's right. That's right. This is about uh, local district attorney's offices and the, the DOJ, and he doesn't have to speak to any of this stuff. And I don't think that he will, because I don't think he wants it to uh, be politicized. Ozzy, talk to me about some of the poll numbers that are coming out. Uh, you know, now folks are throwing some names in on the Republican side. Uh, Liz Cheney, who had not been on the list, is now in a poll, and she's popping up at a 10 percent, which is above some other folks that um, are uh, are already declared or expected to declare. Asa Hutchinson, he threw his hat in the ring uh, over the weekend. How many Republicans do you think you'll see in the race uh, for the presidency? Yeah, I, I, look, I, I think, first of all, that poll that had Liz Cheney, I would call that maybe an outlier. Uh, you know, you can't tell the future, but I can surely tell you that the Republican electorate for a primary isn't going to support a Liz Cheney type candidate for president, but her name's going to be out there. I think the polls today are not going to be the polls that are from a year from now. Uh, so I do think you're going to see people kind of bubble up a little bit as they kind of enter the race. They will get a pop from that and be able to kind of register on some of these polls as they continue to go on. I do think the field's going to narrow. We already saw Larry Hogan 
Hogan opt not to race. There's questions about whether or not Glenn Youngkin and Chris Sununu even jump into this. But I do think, you know, this isn't going to deter others from jumping in. We can expect DeSantis to come in sometime after his legislative sessions over uh, sometime in May. I would say that Mike Pence is probably going to jump in. And then there be maybe some others that look at this as an opportunity to kind of, you know, hit while the president's kind of weak, President Trump's kind of weak, you know, and throw their hat in the ring. But I, I don't think it's going to be as many as there were in 16, but I don't think, you know, it's going to deter for those that have a, a viable shot to actually jump in. Andrew, what, what do you think we're going to see for the list of indictments tomorrow? I mean, I've had a number of conversations with some, not CEOs of the size of Donald Trump or um, alleged size of Donald Trump's empire, uh, but some people talking to me about, listen, when you accidentally commit um, IRS tax fraud, Sometimes they also hit you with a charge of mail fraud, and sometimes they hit you with another charge just so that you can perhaps plead it down. Um, and some people are concerned that this list of indictments is going to be some small nuts and small, you know, I say that in a relative term, uh, small things that don't really add up to a lot. Do you think there might be some bombshell in this list, or is this just going to be a fully vetted, robust list of, of, of indictments? Well, first, I have to warn you, you might lose me. Um, because this may, I'm, I'm running very low on battery here, unfortunately, and I, and I can't charge it, but I'll try to answer very quickly. Uh, first of all, it's 32 charges. You know, it, grand juries are not called for misdemeanors. They are called for felonies. And the fact that it's 32 charges, even if you take into consideration that wire fraud or mail fraud often accompany federal charges because you have to use... Um, the mail or you use, you know, uh, the telephone or whatever it might be to effectuate the crime. That is still an incredibly long list. And what I've been thinking is in the course of this, between this investigation and the Weisselberg investigation, that it is very likely that they discovered additional criminality and that's going to be reflected in those indictments. So people, you know, who are sort of saying this is just a misdemeanor trumped up to be a felony, no pun intended. That doesn't, you don't get 32 charges out of a, out of a grand jury when there isn't something uh, felonious behind those charges. Ozzy, what, what do you think has to happen to break the, the fever? Well, I mean, to go back on yeah, the charges, please. I think the onus is on Alvin Bragg that he better have something. Uh, as we said earlier today, this is something that the Department of Justice looked at and opted not to persecute. The FEC looked at it and opted not to go after it, and Cy Vance looked at it and opted not to go after it. So if Alvin Bragg has something, it better be buttoned up and it better be coming in hot and secure, because if this is something that is whittled down or Donald Trump will be unable to defeat, it's going to get back, you know, it's going to backfire on them, period. Um, what it's going to take to break through, and look, I, you know, Trump's a phenomenon, and I think he's been able to tap into some anger that the general electorate on the Republican side has been festering for, for many, many years. Uh, that is starting to kind of subside some. You're starting to see some of that support bubble up and kind of go to DeSantis uh, as kind of a Trump-like candidate, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure if that's ever going to break away fully from Donald Trump. It's one of those things where if Donald Trump goes away, maybe Trumpism continues. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's something that 25% of the electorate you know, on the Republican side is you know, holding on to. Andrew, we got 20 seconds. Last words? Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens tomorrow and going forward. I think he's going to try to turn it into a circus. I hope the judge issues a gag order. Um, which he won't be able to follow, but I still hope the judge issues a gag order and tries to maintain um, some order and decorum around this. All right, Andrea Cabral, Ozzy Palomo, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate thank both you. of your expertise. Thank you, and thanks to your battery, Andrea. Good job. <laughs> thanks. Next up, the Bruins have already made history in the run-up to the Stanley Cup playoffs. Later this month, the Bees have already qualified for the postseason, and they became the fourth ever team to score 60 regular season wins after coming out on top in a shootout against the St. Louis Blues. The number one team in their division, the Bruins have a few days rest before they look to continue their winning streak on Thursday. Now, are the Bruins the new pride and joy of New England sports? And what can we expect for the rest of the season? I'm joined by former NHL player and Stanley Cup champion Sean McCracken, who is now the head coach for the Suffolk University's men's hockey team, and Steve Conroy, a sports reporter for the Boston Herald. Welcome to both of you. Steve, let's jump in here. How good are these Bruins? Well, the, the, one of the, the best regular season teams of all time, as you, you laid it out in your opening, uh, just one of four teams to, uh, to hit uh, 60 wins. But they're going to be judged on whether they win a Stanley Cup. And as Sean could tell you, 
it's a it's a marathon. It's two months of of you know brutal competition. Guys get hurt. You know, you never know what's going to happen, and it's the it's the most difficult prize to win in all of sports. Sean, as someone who came up watching uh, Bobby Orr and Derek Sanderson, I, I always think about Easter when my mom asked me once what I wanted the Easter Bunny to bring me, and I wanted an autographed Derek Sanderson poster, which I amazingly got from the Easter Bunny. So uh, I love it when we talk about, you know, are, are the Bruins the new hot <laughs> team? When the Bruins have been a hot team on and off for a long time, especially when you were playing with them in the 1990s, what makes this team different from other teams, other Bruins teams? Well, it seems to me by the numbers, they're the best, maybe the best Bruins team they've ever had. Um, you know, you look at David Pasternak with 56 goals. I mean, he's got a chance to put up 60 goals. I don't know who the last Bruin to do that was. And uh, I mean, he's one, he might be the best player, one of the best players in the NHL right now. And you get Patrice Bergeron has been with the team forever and he's scoring 27 goals at 37 years old. All market net's been unbelievable. I mean, they, they've hit it on, Don Sweeney's hit it on every player he's picked up. Everybody's playing at the top of the game right now for the Bruins. But, like, you know, you get into the playoffs, you're just one of the playoffs teams, and you you, you really have to ramp it up once you get there, and you got to worry about injuries and, and everything else. Yeah, you don't want the success of the record to be the footnote that you didn't win <laughs> that season, as Steve, uh, I think, pointed out. Steve, is there a secret sauce here, though, or is this just the perfect um, gelling of all these great players that happen to be in the right place at the right time? Um, or is there is there something that Bruins are doing now that will carry on into the future? Well, this is kind of a one-shot deal for them because we don't know what's going to happen with Patrice Bergeron and David Critchie after this year. They could retire, and I, I wouldn't say the Bruins would have to rebuild after that, but they'd take a step back, no question. But this is, is an incredible season so far. You know, a magical one, as Jim Montgomery said a couple of days ago after they beat Pittsburgh. Um, but it, the way I look at it, I, I look at the start of the season this year. They were without Brad Marchand. They were without Charlie McAvoy. They were without Matt, without Matt Grizzlick. And in training camp, they knew they had to show up you know, it, to be ready to go in October. And they had the work ethic and it just, as they got the players back, it just rolled and rolled and rolled. And, you know, you know as Sean knows, there are some scheduled losses in an 82 game season, but not for this team. You know, they, I think they're 10 and three on, on second half of back to backs. And they, they just refuse to lose on most nights. Sean, we're watching uh, baseball go through some, I wouldn't say dramatic changes, but some updates, if you will, in how the game is played with the, the pitch clock and the time that the batter has to get in and the crazy light shows when someone hits a home run. And certainly hockey has been through some of that. I do remember the, um, the, the electrified puck that we could watch at some point that distracted the heck out of me. It seemed like a good idea at the time. What, what is hockey doing to sort of continue to maintain its standing um, and grow as a sport over the years, especially since you were playing in the 90s? Well, number one, this play is coming from all over the world now. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, everybody played hockey in Boston, Minnesota, and Michigan. Right. Now some of the top players in the world are coming from Florida, Arizona, and California. I think also the NHL has, has, uh, has um, maybe taken more of the violence out of the game. I think a lot of fans enjoyed it back, way back in the day, but now... Um, they allow the skill players to be skillful. I play with Mario Lemieux and Yammer Jagger in Pittsburgh, and there wasn't a shift that they were on the ice that it wouldn't be a penalty right now. So they allow they're allowing the best players in the world to really show what they can do. And the um, I mean the product has been great. You look at a guy like McDavid out of Edmonton; he's just he's an electric buying player, and he's an awful lot of fun to watch. Um, I think some people might be disappointed that they don't see the violence that was back in the '90s. But I think it's a much better product for uh, for TV. I, I have to say that uh, once saw Wayne Gretzky, uh, Gretzky play in L.A. playing the Bruins. Uh, I think it was in the 80s, and it was the longest fight game uh, <laughs> thus far in the history of the NHL. And I was just like, why am I why am I here watching this? But Wayne is he's on on board with the Bruins. Wayne is hoping that the Bruins go all the way. Steve, what what has to happen, right? Besides the no injuries, uh, keeping keeping their head in the game, keeping the energy going what's what are the obstacles ahead of them besides those that are usually built in well they have to get this the the Vezina level goaltending that they've been getting from Almark I'm assuming he's gonna he's gonna run with it for as long as they can um, but 
they've relied on him more than some people would like to admit because they give up some odd man rushes. They push the play a little a little more than than what what previous teams did under under Bruce Cassidy and under uh, Claude Julian. So he's got to be sharp. He has been sharp all year. He sees a lot of high danger chances for a team that's as as dominant as the Bruins are. Um, they're not quite the '80s Edmonton Oilers, but you know they give up some chances. Mm-hmm. And he's been there, and so has Jeremy Swayman been there to to, to you know bail them out when they've faced odd man rushes and breakaways and and the, the like. Sean, what do you see as the obstacles in the path moving forward? Well, I think a big thing when you get to the playoffs is, is the officiating going to be the same as it is uh, during the regular season. In the past, sometimes the officiating switches and they allow more hooking, holding, uh, more slow the game down. Hopefully they keep the, the same the same level of officiating. You asked earlier about the secret sauce to this team, and I think you can't go. Uh, Jim Montgomery's done an unbelievable job with this team. And I think when you go from Claude Julian to um, Bruce Cassidy, two guys that are kind of disciplined type of guys, uh, very honest with the media, uh, criticized players quite a bit more than Jim would. I think Jim brings a fre- breath of fresh air, allowing his defenseman to jump in the play a lot more offense. And Steve says they give up a lot of chances, and I agree with that. But at the same time, when you play against a team like this that that creates so much offense, it's it, you know that if, if you're on the other team, if you give up chances, you're going to get scored on. And the Bruins are so confident that they, they they're not they're willing to give up a few chances because they know they're gonna they're gonna put theirs in the net. I I've uh, enjoyed watching this team that more than any team I've seen in a long time. That's kind of how I play Wordle. You know, I don't mind if I blow a couple of a couple of <laughs> tries there because I know I'm going to get it in the end. So I'm going to call these Bruins the Wordle team. Sean, your prediction? You think they're going to go all the way? I think they will if they stay healthy for sure. The only the only scary part is you got like like Steve said, you got Bergeron and Krejci. They're big players for them. They're both they're both in their late 30s. And I know how I felt in my late 30s, so I give them all the credit in the world. How about you, Steve? Gun to the to the head, yes. I would I would bet on the Bruins, but that's why I don't bet hockey, because it's it's you know, it's a crapshoot. <laughs> it sure is. Now you've lots of opportunities to bet from what I understand from all the ads. <laughs> yeah. so. I've Maybe. seen a couple of commercials. Just a couple. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I know where you two, two will be as the games are, are being played forward. I appreciate so much you both joining me. Thanks so much and go Bruins. Thank you. That's it for tonight. But come back tomorrow. We will continue our discussion surrounding the latest news in the criminal case against Donald Trump and its implications for the country. Plus, an inside look into the decades long Afghanistan war with both U.S. and Taliban officials in the latest from Frontline. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Good night. Next time on Anti-